I was looking through my notes and Molly came on the masterclass in May last year. Does that sound right? Yeah. Yeah, it's over a year or so now. Uh, up in the generator down the road there. And for a couple months after that, I don't think we had any personal contact, but then out of the blue she emailed me and we had a call and she shared how she was using the game. And I can't even remember exactly, the, the Maya Angelou quote is so true here, because I can't remember what we talked about in that call or um, how it went about, but after that I was like, okay, Molly's doing some cool stuff with this game. <laughs> I'd love to keep in contact with her. And, and since then, um, you've now become the uh, chief people and culture, chief of something like that at Rush Digital. And the other day she mentioned that she was potentially going to be using the game for candidate journey mapping. And I was like, instantly, I was like, oh, okay. Uh, I would love to learn more. And there will be other people who will be thinking about how we use the game in this space as well. And so I was like, Molly, will you please come and share a bit of your story? And, and pre that as well, because she's done some amazing stuff pre that. So Molly's going to share a couple of stories about those few things. All righty. Um, first of all, like it's a really lovely group and it's so nice to see so many friendly, familiar faces. Um, I was saying to someone earlier, um, as much as I like sharing stories and getting people on board with things I care about, I feel really weird talking at people because I love conversations. So um, it was really nice to have the time previously to get to chat and catch up with a few people. Um, so, I guess my story is like a little bit of a work in progress, but I think the version is more that it's just part of my toolkit. So, while I have run some sort of larger scale workshops, which I think is kind of more common in the consulting world, I just sort of pick it up and use it when I can. So um, I'll share with you really briefly some of the key things I've used it for that might be um, a little bit different or just show the variety. Um, and then I thought I'd talk through how I'm using it in the moment to um, map our candidate journey at Rush, where I work at the moment. Um, so when I did the masterclass, I was uh, in a role as an agile consultant and I was playing the role of a scrum master at the time. So it was kind of the um, perfect sort of experimental role to use it in because I was facilitating most of my day different types of meetings. Um, and basically I used it nearly every day that I was facilitating something as my check-in. Like I would Google things online and find new interesting ways to keep the teams interested but they just love this as the check-in and that's one of the things I've learned is that people never really seem to get sick of it and I've talked to you about that before Jeremy, you're just like, are you guys sick of this yet? We've done it so many times and um, actually that team that I was working with, I caught up with someone recently and they're like, oh, Molly we really miss you in the emotional culture deck. <laughs> um, so I use that as... Um, my way of building and maintaining psychological safety with those squads that I was working in. Um, I think the first time I ran the full work workshop was with a new leadership team. Um, and I think my biggest learning experience out of that was it was a group of about nine leaders who had been through a big restructure. A lot of people had been made redundant. They were not in the greatest headspace. I don't really think they wanted to work together. They didn't want to do agile. Um, but it was like the fastest way I've ever seen a group of people build trust with one another. So whenever I am working with a group where I just want to fast track trust building, that was a really good experience for me um, to sort of see that. It was also like a really good experience to learn good facilitation style because people don't like being given options in situations like that. They just really want to be told what to do. Um, another interesting one was a piece of work that I did for uh, people that had been displaced after a restructure. How, what, how might we better set this group of people up to have skills that are fit for the future of work? And so we took them through a um, Scrum Master program and I did the first week which was about how to make yourself marketable um, out there and what I did with that was how do you know yourself and how do you know what's important to you? So I took this group of people that had been made redundant through the emotion, emotional culture deck exercise and it was, it was actually like when I was doing it, what was I thinking? <laughs> like, it, was, it was quite full on. Um, but 
it was part of a canvas that I got them to work through around what are their strengths, what are the things that bring them joy, that energise them, what are the skills you have to offer, what's different about you, but also what do you care about? So when you're going out there, what questions can you ask to make sure that your new workplace is going to be a place that makes you feel good and not feel the things you don't want to feel? Um, so yeah, that was quite an interesting one. Um, the first time I hacked it, I hadn't actually done the training yet, and um, yeah, definitely a lot of learnings. But the the mess, the um, the problem was an organisation of 3,000 plus people wanted to redesign their performance management approach, and Molly, can you? They want to do it in a human-centred design, design thinking way. Can you get them to do that? And I was like, oh, I better get researching that. Um, and I think the biggest thing I took from that was. Um, in the empathy mapping stage, you really need the skills to be empathetic and question people well. And we were doing these really large workshops, and it was with this HR team. Um, and so I used the emotional culture deck to try and illustrate to them how to get to a deeper level of empathy. I didn't explain it very well, so I had a lot of learnings, and they were like, we don't really understand why we did that. But um, I think now I would be able to do it in a much better way. <laughs> um, and so now, the, um, the main story that I wanted to share in a little bit more detail, and just tell me if you need me to um, hurry along, because I can mumble along. Um, so in my role at Rush now, um, I work in a people and culture team of myself and sort of two more junior members. Um, it's a, t a team of 75 people, but it has got so, so much... Um, volume, like it's a really busy job and I'm teaching two junior people at the same time. And so I don't have the luxury of sort of running big programs of work or really thinking about them in depth as much as I'd like to. It's very much like amongst the chaos of everything that's urgent, like yesterday and like someone's literally probably crying about the thing you haven't done yet. Where do you find these moments to be intentional about what you're doing? And one of our biggest pain points is we don't really have um, a recruitment process that's written down anywhere. Um, and so every time we go through something, and we recruit a lot, a lot of contractors, more than once in every process we have to change what we're looking for. Um, and sometimes we even get to the point where we've found the perfect person and we don't need them anymore. Um, so it's like, it's, it's like a nightmare. Um, but we, I sat down with the team and we're like, we need to write this down. We need to give clear expectations to people about what we need them to do um, just to make our lives a little more seamless. But also we have all these candidates who are having a really crappy experience. Um, and so we sat down and started mapping out the process. And I was like, who is this process? going to serve? Is it for us? Because if it's just for us, then what value are we delivering? And so um, I was like, how do we build the experience of our candidates into this process while we make our lives easier? Um, and we're probably spending like the most minute zero capacity hours on this project while we're doing everything else. And um, Abby, who's one of our um, senior product designers, was sort of sitting across the way and I was like, Hey, Abby, do you want some experience running a human-centered design facilitation for Candidate Journey Map? And she's like, okay. And so I just booked in two hours with her. Um, and she, she'd prepared it. She had us a Miro board. It was really cool. And um, so the process that she took us through was, first of all, what are we trying to achieve? What do we want to get out of it? And so it was very much like smooth process for our team, make our lives easier. We want people to have like not just a good experience, but like a lovely experience with us. Um, we want our managers in the business to see our people and culture team as having a brand that, um, that they're excited about. We're there to support and serve them. Um, and so we went through all of that part, and then we went through a stage that were who are all of the people, who are the touch points of this journey? So obviously candidates, and we kind of broke it down, managers, hiring teams, executive members, admin, like quite a lot of points. Then we did a service blueprint, which is honestly like probably 100 boxes of all of the different streams of work that go in a recruitment process, and then all the arrows and diagrams of what order they happen in. Like, <laughs> 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 
Um, and then we got to what is the candidate journey. So just through the lens of the candidate, what are the steps that they take? Um, which was very much like, what is the goal of a candidate when they're applying? What are their actions? What is the goal? What is the actions when they're having an interview, a phone screen, all of the things? Um, and then there's a box that we go through that has an emoji of like five different emojis and how do you think they feel at each of those stages? Um, and so we did that and then I was like, let's actually get a little bit deeper into how they're feeling and use the emotional culture deck. So we ran this session um, just earlier this week um, and what we did was we said, in the group of five of us that were working on it, let's choose um, five cards of each that we think people are currently feeling um, when they go through a whole recruitment process. Um, and so we, we came up with some themes and then with the um, unpleasant feelings, we highlighted which ones we think we could influence um, because, you know, applying for a job is pretty... Um, confronting as it is, no matter how great the experience. And so we did that and we kind of got out, I think I've jotted them down here, what the key ones were. Um, we thought that the, the unpleasant feelings that people would feel was alone, intimidated and doubt. And the intimidated one was really interesting because it wasn't just a recruitment experience, it was our recruitment experience because we have some very... Uh, talented, amazing people, but also some people with the attitude I feel that's like, well, you would be so lucky to work here. And that's, I would never want someone to feel that because if they were, then they're your equal, if not, you know, like, let's make everyone feel welcome on an even playing field, recognised for their strengths, whether it's what we're looking for or not. Um, so we did that. And then the next exercise we did was if we were to just go utopia and someone wanted a job here with us, what are the things we would want them to feel? And so we did five of each, kind of found the commonalities. Um, we wanted people to feel connected, involved and curious. And we really didn't want people to feel alienated, alone or insulted. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we haven't done this yet, but just in terms of what the next steps are in this program of work, so we kind of do it for two hours every couple of weeks. Um, what we're going to do next is on our service map, so the process, and on the candidate journey, insert all of those themes that we highlighted around people's feelings, around where we think they currently are feeling them, but where are the opportunities for the, for the ones that we want to design for, um, and then we're going to sit down and basically do a prioritisation so we can take an agile approach to just biting off small chunks. So we'll choose the parts of the process that we think are going to be the most impactful for the least effort and just work through that as, as we go. Um, so some of the things that, I, um, that I've learned sort of through my journey of using the emotional culture deck is it always gives you a reality check. Like it's so grounding. Um, I talk about it like often, but I get really annoyed about like the whole concept of business and what even is an organisation and professionalism and all of these things. And it's kind of like the quote up there. It's like you can have this like made up world of the corporate place, but as soon as you do this, you're like, oh, that's right, we're human. And so it's like a really nice way of humanising people in any situation. Um, it was a really good tool for me to learn how to facilitate. Like, it's a gift when you can give someone a container to work in and just give them the freedom and they don't have to think about things. Um, never worry that it might not work. Like, I always, I still do. Like, even with my own leadership team, I'm like, oh, what are they going to think? But I do exactly the same thing. I'm like, we're going to play a game. And then you can't get people to stop. Like, it always happens. Um, and yeah, so, so my thing is always just, uh, there's always an opportunity to experiment with it and you don't have to make a big plan of a facilitation, like you said, keep it in your pocket and something will just come to you. So yeah, that's my story. <laughs> And we didn't follow that approach. 
we followed a, a, a relatively different approach. We talked about touch points, but then for each touch point, we went through the cards and said, this is how we want to refer to each of the touch points. And we just looked through touch point by touch point. And I just love the variety. Everybody, you'll look at your problem or your challenge in your own unique way and then use the games for that. And I look at it, I'll look at it my way, but we'll still get to a place which is, which is really, um, which is a really great place to do that. And that's the beauty of being able to hack it. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm stoked that you found a new way to do that. Yeah. Any um, questions for um, I just wanted to say, like, I felt it was really important when you said to focus on how we can influence the emotion. Because yeah. we try and bite off more than we can chew. We're like, oh, let's try and control all of these things. Whereas like, we can't control how people feel. Mm -hmm. But we can influence and create an environment where we can help them to feel more of those mm -hmm. things. So I really love that you said, like, where can we focus on influencing mm -hmm. rather than making someone feel something. Yeah, I thought that was really good. Nice.